to the startup grind. The other thing, by the way, um, is you know I have amazing mentors. So like in that same context, I asked Ben, you know what. What does the head of CS do? And he was like, fuck you. What do you mean, what does the head of CS do? I don't know. And, I, and I, he's like, well, first fucking rule of hiring an executive is get leverage. And I was like, whoa, what the fuck does that mean? And, and like now that's my lens. So when I hire someone in an interview, I'm like, do they give me leverage? Do I believe that if I hired this person, I'm going to not deal with many, many things? The second thing he said to me is, um, you know, if you have a meeting with someone and you spend an hour with someone you're interviewing about their function and they should know it, and you didn't learn anything, don't fucking hire them. And I was like, well, light dawns on marble head. That seems like it. Mm. And, and, and so I think, like, leverage your mentors, right? Find CEOs or other founders and ask them about their point of view or read books. That's worked for me. Um, but look, I, I mean, I think the biggest thing about being a CEO is being a CEO is an unnatural thing. Unnatural. Unnatural. It's yes. like super unnatural. Why is it unnatural? Well, one, I mean, if you have the right board and the right kind of idea, you're the only person in the company who could like literally pivot the company on a dime. So you have to have both fearlessness to do it, but also the ability to like process that limited data. Because, wow. You get some bad luck for some microphones, man. Fuck you, microphone. <laughs> Are we switching? switching? Yeah, We're having fun here. Um, yeah, but I mean, like, what was I saying? Sorry, I lost my train of thought. You distracted me with the microphone. The, um, the, uh, unnatural. Yeah. Oh, super unnatural to be a CEO. Why? Well, one, um, total freedom. I mean, when have you guys ever like lived in some world where you could just be like, tomorrow I'm gonna fire half the team and we're gonna do a different whole business and fucking go get the board to like like the new thing that we like? Um, and and I'm, I'm speaking as a founding CEO, by the way. I'm not like, what the fuck do I know about being a CEO in a big company? Um, that's unnatural. Uh, um, it's it's uh, super unnatural that um, everyone's watching what you do all the time. That was a huge challenge for me. So if I got past, oh thank God. More wine. Um, <laughs> by the way, I'm like this every day. It's not like the wine does anything. Exactly. Uh, it feels like the um, oh, Fuck. What was I saying again? Shit. Unnatural, yeah. but I had a theme. Watching you every day. Yeah, yeah, people are watching you. So this was huge for me. Like, honestly, so I'm a, can you tell I'm an intense personality? And if I disagree with you, I'd be like, what the fuck are you doing? Um, you can't do that as CEO. <laughs> I, seriously, you can't do that as CEO. So when you become a CEO, you, you have a megaphone. And, and the megaphone is, is incredibly intense for people inside the company. So if we had a meeting and you know, one of the developers showed me a feature and I was like, what the fuck are you doing? This is the dumbest <laughs> fucking feature I've ever fucking seen. And by the way, the usability sucks. Uh, you know, that person would go home and just feel like their, like their dog got killed. Um, and so, and, and on the flip side, people are watching every, like, you know, who are you meeting with? And uh, so I think there's a public level, like, you never take down, like, right now I'm being real. And I, I mean, really real in our all hands, but, but you know, it's, it's a role. And look, people who work for us, for CEOs, are literally putting their entire family, their retirement, their kids' college on the line for us. And a lot of that that they do is for us personally. Like they don't, you know, I, I'm like, oh, I have a $60 billion market. I know how to size the market. That engineer doesn't know. I'm, they're saying, hey, Michelle, do I believe you? Um, and so there's, there's a really, public responsibility, I feel like, to, um, I call it the becoming, part of why I, I, I think, I believe in therapy, but, but I, I think a CEO who is not cognizant of um, both their responsibility and the impact you can have on a person who's like killing themselves for the company, and you didn't even know, you just walked by their desk and you know, you were like, well, I don't know what you're doing, or you know, I was cranky, had a shitty day, I woke up, I fucking flew back on a red eye or something, and I'm just like, you know, they, like small things to people. So that was an adjustment for me. Um, I know it sounds obvious, but when you guys become founders and CEOs, it's, it's a different thing. You have to really, really work at it. Um, and one thing that I think is important, it works for me, so, um, 
is the... You're more composed than I am. I can tell <laughs> that, that's true whether it's two people, 10 people, mm. 30 people, 50 people. Yeah. Once you get to 100, it starts to change a bit. But two and five and 10 and 20 and 30, it still matters. I mean, even oh. for your four or five people, the CEO still carries a lot more weight than you think if you've never done it before because you just don't it's, yeah. you just don't think that way. Yeah. It's just not natural. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think the other piece of it too, I mean, um, kind of mistakes I've made, you know, we over rotated early on too much to like we wanted the ten Xers. You guys we use that term, like we were looking for unicorns and we hired people. We we're like, how do I get like the ten X engineer, or the ten X person? Um, and look, my current belief is Get the talent, the most talented person you can, but a high-performing team will crush ICs anytime. And uh, you know, our, our lens has changed pretty dramatically. Like if, if if you were telling me, hey, you know, you can hire this 10x engineer who's done it all and fucking thinks that their shit doesn't stink, and I can hire a more junior person whose attitude's going to be good every day and is going to be a great teammate and is going to like have grit and be positive when it's hard, that's the person you should hire. By the way, experience is not good in your company. My, my, all my directs are super experienced. Like, so my leadership team, I, I don't know how many, seven or eight people, super experienced. And at that level, I want super experienced people. But everywhere else in the company, I want fucking people who do not know how fucked up it's going to be. Like, <laughs> I, I want people, I, I would bias if I was doing it again, and I've made, this is Michelle having made all mistakes. Uh, I, would, I would bias to fearlessness. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't realize, and I don't mean fearlessness in the sense that like fearlessness like a founder. I mean, my one of my observations has been, you know, we all like to hire experienced people, like somebody who worked at a startup before, and therefore they've they're bringing all these scars. Here's the problem: they're going to come to your company and like try and fix all these imaginary problems from their last company that may or may not be relevant to your current company. Um, and and by the way. Sometimes, and specifically on the engineering side, one of my observations is that you know they can then like want to build this perfect architecture, and I'm like, I don't give a fuck about this perfect. Like, can I just have some features tomorrow? <laughs> um, so I I think like I don't think it's culture. Like I think we talk about culture. Um, culture organically evolves, but I think it's like really really hiring people who can come in and like crush it, work their ass off, be a great teammate. Um, and I, to be honest, you know, as having spent so many years, you know, working at Mercury and then being, leading the acquisition and being at Apti where we hired all these senior people, I think if I was doing it over again, I would have hired a bunch of like junior people to start the company who didn't know any better. Um, because, and by the way, as a founder, I think my experience pays off every day. Um, but, you know, I think having too much experience in your company slows you down. People, people are worried about a lot of imaginary stuff. I don't know, I, I ranted on. That was, I don't know how long I talked about your last question. <laughs> One of the things that I think, you know, we uh, as founders, you know, have to learn is, you know, the ability to, um, uh, humility, you know, know when we're you know really really wrong or even a little bit wrong, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, be able to communicate that in a mm -hmm. in a good way, yeah. Uh, yeah. not a scary way, because yeah. it, it can yeah. be scary if you're yeah. uh, for the for the team. Mm -hmm. So what are, what are the things? What what conversations have you had over the last two or three years that like like could have been scary, or maybe they were scary. Yeah, maybe they were scary to the team. Like what are some things, and how do you approach those kind of conversations? Like like you know, I go back just like, for instance, like yeah. I had a company one time that, yeah. that, that miserably failed and I had to walk into the room and say, you're not gonna get paid, right? It's just, it's not gonna happen this yeah. week, so I'm sorry, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a really tough conversation. Yeah, it's not fun. Not fun. So what- I what, haven't done that one. <laughs> so what is it, what, what things have you done over the last couple years that have been, you know, things that you've had to do and how did you coach yourself to do that? Huh. Well, I think um, one of the challenges about being a founder is that you have to be irrationally right and yet humble, right? So that's a very hard personality trait to get right. What do I mean by irrationally right? So when I was founding the company, I interviewed a lot of people. That's how I kind of came up with the user mind idea. I'm not from sales and marketing. I don't know if anybody read my bio, but like I've been building tooling for dweebs for like my whole life. So like I don't fucking I don't even know what sales and marketing is now. Um, 
And so I just went and interviewed a lot of people and said, oh, I think there's a gap here, I'm gonna build a product. Um, but you get a lot of things wrong. I mean, um, so, so, so from my perspective, how do you know, I did, so I did a bunch of interviews, we kind of like built this prototype, right? We built a little demo and we're showing it to people. So in that meeting, you demo it to somebody and they're like, I don't know what the fuck you just built, this thing is the dumbest thing. Like, are they right or are they wrong? So as a founder, you have to be able to say, oh, that's signal, meaning like they're right, I should iterate, or they're, or like this is just, like this person doesn't know what I'm talking about. I'm right. So being really right actually is a superpower of being a founder, and being irrationally committed, you have to be. Do you know how many no's you're gonna get for every yes and every phase of building your company? People who don't wanna come work for you, VCs who are fucking dumb and don't wanna give you money, <laughs> fuck them. Um, you know, customers who are like, oh, I don't understand what the fuck you're talking about, and I'm like, this is the most amazing thing you've ever seen, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> um, so, you, you have to be irrationally right. Here's the, here's the flip side, to your point. You're wrong, you're mostly wrong. So, uh, within our company, I talk a lot about a million mistakes I made. I mean, I'm, I'm not a product person by trade, so a good example of user mind, no one's seen the product, but we do workflow. And, you know, I didn't realize how important, like, we happened to when we built the product, we like connected to the app and copied all the data. And we had to do it because I was irrationally obsessed with this fucking dumb feature, which is still, you know, the best thing ever. Um, and it really is an important feature. But like, for this feature, we had to copy all the data. And um, like, for the first two years, I didn't realize that, holy fuck, the data might be as valuable or more valuable than this damn rules engine we're building, uh, and it took us a long time to be like, oh, I guess that really is just as valuable, and now if you look at our positioning, we have a whole customer data platform, and we built rules on it, and I tell you, it was, holy shit, we're like so smart, fucking, we built this, you want my pitch? We built a converged architecture. It's a converged architecture. Fuck is a converged architecture. Yeah. Okay, well, we, we are amazing we. because we knew that we needed all the customer data and that rules engines and data platforms were converging and that's our essential architectural advantage. But, but, like, <laughs> that's what I say now. Uh, but within the company, I'm always like, guys, I was fucking wrong. And that was the yeah. big problem because I didn't realize we needed the data and like we did it first, you know, five or ten implementations and the customers were like, holy shit, why can't we play with this data and explore the data and like, oh my god. Uh, so uh, I think being a founder is really um, bipolar in that sense, that you have to be able to, when you believe it's really right, um, and, and on that flip side, like the reason we have the data is, uh, if you saw a demo of our product, do you guys use, everyone in here ever code? You use autocomplete? So I was obsessed with this feature to do autocomplete in the rules engine. I mean, it's still one of the reasons people love the product, but that's why we have the data. And so I think it's very hard to be like, am I really right? And is this a thing I'm gonna bet the company on? Like this usability really, really is core. Um, or am I wrong? And in this case, I didn't realize how valuable the data was. And the answer is I'm both people. Um, and I think, you know, you have to, as a CEO, I, I think lead by example. So I try to be, I try to be actually more disclosing of my own gaps and failures because it creates room for other people in the company. Mm -hmm. So if, if, you know, and like an example was I had a staff meeting today. Um, we we're talking about, um, we we're reviewing attrition in the company. Um, we're talking about, you know, is the attrition something we wanted or not wanted, you know, regrettable or non-regrettable, and, and why? Like, were we, do we mishire, or is it an issue in the company? And we had a really good discussion about it. And, you know, one of the things I was saying is one of my strengths in the company as an exec, we're talking about leadership. And, you know, we, we feel like we had a problem in one of the areas where we're trying to really think about our leadership and, and you know, how do we help the team have context or what can we do better? Um, and you know, in that conversation, I said to the guys, "Look, one of my superpowers is I'm 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 the visionary. I'm charismatic. You know, in our all hands, I go and pitch the vision, and people buy in." Here's a negative. I mean, I can walk into a meeting and be like, "I've asked for this update five times, and no one's done it." And like for me, the entire company is going to fail if we don't solve this problem. And I roll into the meeting, and I'm like, "You know, fuck you all. Deliver this thing now and do it." Uh, and let me tell you, if you're an IC, that's terrifying. And uh, you know, if you're one of my directs, that's disempowering. Um, and so, you know, in this meeting, I was saying to my direct team, like, 
I recognize my own challenges. Like, and you as my directs have to help me solve this problem. Like, we're, we're all a team. Uh, so I so think- you're, you're I, saying call me out. I'm saying I'm gonna call myself out and give you permission to be real, and then my expectation is that we're as a team gonna rise above. So if we had a bad meeting, I expect you to tell me, hey, that person got shut down, or, you know, boy, you're my direct, like, you need to give me that feedback. This is really hard for me to deal with. Um, uh, so I don't, I, I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I, think, I think humility is essential. I think irrationality is essential. Um, and I think, generally speaking, most people who work for you and this may be biased because it's my, my personal style, is like, I believe in authenticity over anything. You know, the one thing about working for me really? is you're never, you're never gonna guess <laughs> where you stand. Um, but I mean, I think I'm an immensely flawed person, immensely. But I don't think it doesn't matter. I mean, every one of my directs is also flawed. Did you ever see Remember from the Titans? Anyone see that movie? I kind of love that movie. Um, Denzel Washington, right? Oh, yeah, and they're yeah, like, yeah. It's, the, it's the team where they get integrated. Yeah. You know, one of the things he said that stuck with me is he said, we're gonna be perfect. But he said, we're gonna be perfect as a team. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I always tell everybody, like, like, we're all people, first of all. No one's, I mean, that's what, that's what I don't like about big companies. Big companies pretend you're a professional. And professionals are different than people. I, I don't know, I don't know what they're talking about. Uh, one, everyone's a person. Um, and two, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be perfect as a person. And no one's expecting to, you to. You have to be yeah. perfect as a team. Whether it's like within a function, within engineering, or it's your leadership team. Um, but I try and, one of the leadership principles I believe in is show the way, model the way. And if you want your team to be honest, be honest. If you want your team to be vulnerable, be vulnerable. If you want them to like be afraid of, you know, not afraid of failure, talk about your failures. So, I don't know if it works. You have to come to the company and decide whether you buy, whether you not. But. So, look, I'm gonna take a different, uh, different approach here. So, I ask every, literally every guest that sits in this chair, hmm. and there's been, I don't know, 90, 100. Oh no, I'm afraid um, of this question. So, no, it's easy. Um, so, what was your first job that you had, that you got paid, that <laughs> wasn't from a relative? I worked at a convenience store. How old were you? 14. It was a block from my house. I walked down the road, I said, I need a fucking job, I wanna buy candy, I wanna buy tab. <laughs> at the time. At 14 you said fucking candy? <laughs> at the time I wanted to buy tab. Tab. It wasn't even Diet Coke, it was tab. <laughs> Cheetos, whatever, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I didn't get an so allowance. Store, so my parents are really poor. I didn't get an allowance. How many? Uh, how long did you work in the convenience store? A long time, actually. Well, I worked there throughout my high school career, and then um, I'm, a, I'm a college dropout. So I moved back home. My mom was like, "You have to pay rent. <laughs> get a fucking job." <laughs> uh, really, she didn't say fucking, yeah. but um, yeah. so I went back to convenience store work. And I actually worked my way up to run five gas stations and a bunch of restaurants. And most of what I know about management came from that time in my yeah. career. And then I just got lucky in 98. There was a boom. There was no you know, people in tech. There was not enough people in tech. And um, my partner at the time called me and said, there's this just, amazing just job. take this issue. Yeah, you should interview for this. So um, yeah, working in a convenience store. And, and honestly, uh, here's my thing. Who works in convenience stores? Uh, everyone. Young kids, right? Yeah. Like college, you know, like yeah. high school, college people, but who else? Immigrants. Could be. Who else? Uh, <laughs> people who aren't you and I, who don't have every opportunity or every gift, who have MS or who weren't as bright or who didn't have ever, like, these are the people who are, you know, they don't have a choice. Like, we have a choice. We're like the most blessed group of people in the world. Um, and the most amazing thing to me was, I called it in my head, like it's like the books and covers lesson. I'd interview people who'd like have, you know when I say you have a UI? Like you're, you'd like look all put together, and you know, fucking dressed all nice in your iron your shirt, and you'd suck. You'd like come to work and you didn't care. You didn't care that the you know shelves were fronted, and you didn't care. You didn't like mop the floor, and you didn't care about your till, and your till was always off. And there were all these unexpected people 
who uh, didn't look the way expected or you know, kind of didn't have every opportunity in life, but they cared passionately about the perfection of their job. And you know, I'd hired them and like the floor was clean and their toll was one cent off. And like mm, they fronted it. everything. And to me that in startup land, you're seeking that thing. Yeah. Like when my passionate pursuit of my own perfection has nothing to do with my level, my title, my role, my job. Um, and uh, that was like one of the best things I ever did. Yeah, find those people, yeah. hire those people. Totally. Yeah. yeah, wherever they are. Yeah, and um, I have one particular person in mind, but who I just, you know, shouldn't have hired and like glad I did. Amazing. Yeah. Um, she had MS, by the way. It was pretty amazing. Yeah. And where where are the things that, the things that change um, perspective, like what changes your perspective? Because um, it's a different perspective, working at Mercury or sure. HP or yeah. wherever. Uh, and and running an, an, an entity uh, and running an entity. What what is the thing um, that changes your perspective for you? Do you understand that question? Not sure. Yeah. So let me reframe it. Um, so in your in your work life, right, and mm -hmm. what you're doing on a daily basis, uh, and then what you were doing on a daily basis, whether it was HP or Mercury mm -hmm. or wherever, mm -hmm. um, what today changes your perspective? on how you perceive uh, individuals mm -hmm. and teams. Like, what are things that have changed Michelle's perspective on that piece? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, some of it's the mistakes you made, right? So, um, my mishires, right? Or my, you know, you learn by doing. So you learn kind of, you hire people, um, and you're what you expect, and you hire people when they're not what you expect, and you're trying to kind of triangulate uh, across that. Um, frankly, what I've learned is I'm a shitty interviewer. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not in some sense, but um, I learned what my team is really good at, so I, um, I definitely now understand how to like suss out the various things. So I know what I'm looking for, and I know uh, kind of how to architect a team to hire it. Um, you know, everyone's different. I would say uh, things that, the other thing that changes my perspective is um, I'm really failure motivated. Uh, and by failure, I don't mean losing a deal. So, I mean, I remember like the five deals I've lost in my career and I'm obsessed about them and I would do anything to win a deal. But um, much more emotionally, like I remember, I, I am really affected by bad meetings I have. So I was actually in my staff meeting today and. Um, we're talking about a particular problem, and one of my uh, senior staff people said what well, what was her reality, and uh, something that I disagree with actually. Uh, I didn't didn't like her perspective, uh, and you know if I could do that moment over, I shouldn't have challenged that. I should have let someone else in the team respond and let the entire team engage her because. In that meeting, it's actually much more important that my team debate and be aligned. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I didn't, and I really didn't agree with the point of view that was expressed. <laughs>